We're going to be talking about empiricism and the philosophy of mind uh, today. This is Seller's most famous uh, work. It's almost certainly his most important uh, work. Uh, it's the first thing he wrote that really got any traction uh, in the sense that other people who listened to it saw that there was important philosophy going on here. Uh, the catchphrase, the myth of the given, uh, is uh, epitomizes for most people what you get uh, out of empiricism and the philosophy of mind, that he uh, argued that the notion of givenness is pervasive in post-Cartesian philosophy, uh, and that it's a fundamental mistake. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to talk about that. Uh, it is uh, basically just an application of the Kantian normative revolution, uh, an example of applying the distinction between uh, normative matters and causal matters to uh, fundamental uh, epistemological issues. In that regard, I think it's uh, the announcement of allegiance to neo-Kantianism and the claim that that uh, Kantian distinction between uh, questions of fact and questions of justification uh, remains a fundamental one and a, a lesson that's insufficiently appreciated today. Uh, though that's very important, uh, I don't think it's anything like the best uh, philosophical move that he makes in the first half uh, of this essay. Uh, I think there's just a, a stunning uh, argument that he gives, diagnosis uh, that he gives uh, in his treatment of Luke's talk, uh, which contributes to uh, not so much the argument against uh, givenness as to our appreciation of all the many forms that givenness can show up in, uh, the different guises that it can, uh, can wear. So uh, for me, the high point of today is going to be telling that story. Uh, but I want to work up to it uh, uh, a little bit. Um, because the argument of <clears throat> uh, the first about eight sections of um, uh, this essay is also uh, a master class in philosophical analysis, and I think worth appreciating in those terms. So he starts off with three distinctions uh, and then uses them to dissect uh, uh, a line of argument. And this is, uh, first, what he calls the notorious ing-ed ambiguity, uh, and second, the distinction between particulars and facts, uh, and third, the distinction between uh, justificatory and causal matters, or as he says, epistemic and non-epistemic, uh, which is a, uh, a special case of the justification cause distinction. So this notorious ing-ed uh, ambiguity uh, is between, uh, he, he's talking about uh, the notion of sense or of sensation uh, and points out that uh, we can be talking about acts of sensing uh, or we can talk about the contents that are sensed. Uh, and his general uh, recommendation for philosophical and conceptual hygiene uh, is whenever you have one of these words that admits of the notorious ing ed ambiguity, that you, particularly in your own thinking, but also when you're reading a text, go through and systematically disambiguate. Uh, ask whether this is the, the act, the ing we're talking about, or uh, the content, the ed. And it's remarkable how many uh, philosophically significant concepts are like this, let's admit this uh, ambiguity. The notion of belief uh, is like this. There are acts or states of believing, uh, and there's what's believed. 
or uh, what's believable. Um, knowledge, uh, again, acts of knowing what is known. Judgment, act of judging and what's judged. Intention, perception, the act of perceiving and what's perceived. Action, the doing and what's done. Evaluation, and the act or attitude of evaluating or valuing on the one hand, and what's valued uh, on the other hand. Experience is a term like this. Acts of experiencing and what's experienced. Um, that one and its cognates in particular are responsible for one of the great uh, arguments by equivocation in modern philosophical history in Berkeley, uh, who, uh, arguing on plausible if contestable uh, grounds that anything real can be experienced is experienceable, uh, and ending up arguing that the content of all of our experience is experiencings, that all we can know is experiencings. Uh, and it, it's uh, a salutary exercise to go through and catch the slide from the ing to the ed uh, in generally the Barclayan uh, lines of argument. Uh, but for more recent, more plausible claims, uh, when Frege says uh, a fact is a thought that is true, he doesn't mean a fact is a thinking that's true. He better not. There aren't enough acts of thinking around for all the facts. Uh, thought for him is not a thinking. Uh, thought is the content thought. What's thinkable? Uh, that, uh, Vienna is the capital of Austria, say, is a thinkable. Uh, my particular thinking of it isn't, it, it isn't involved in his claim that a fact is a thought that is true. A fact is a thinkable that's true. So uh, the, the observation is uh, that a lot of philosophically significant words admit this ambiguity. Uh, that's not for no reason uh, that there are these two aspects uh, is fundamental to intentionality. Uh, so um, in, in general, the acts are what's studied by some sort of pragmatics, uh, what's specified in a pragmatic metavocabulary for talking about things we can do, attitudes we can have, uh, states we can be in on the one hand, and the contents of them that's specifiable in some kind of semantic uh, metavocabulary, uh, specifying the content of uh, these acts uh, on the other hand. Uh, and again, the counsel of wisdom is uh, never let yourself, when you're trying to think carefully, think in terms of thoughts or beliefs or perceptions. Uh, make yourself disambiguate every occurrence of it into either the ing form or the able form, really, I would say, uh, is typically what's at, uh, at, ish, at, at issue, uh, the, the act of thinking and uh, the thinkables. The second distinction uh, is between uh, what's expressed by declarative sentences and what's referred to by singular terms. Uh, between facts uh, and objects or particulars. Uh, now, looking ahead, if you remember back from my uh, introductory remarks, the issue of how we should think about the world, reality, what there is, uh, should we think it is going to be uh, one that uh, looms large in Sellers' metaphysics. Should we think of the world uh, 
the way Wittgenstein does in the Tractatus as the world of facts, as everything that is the case, uh, or should we think of it as a world of objects, of particulars, the way nominalists do, the way Sellers will argue we should. Reality, in the narrow sense for him, is just a collection of things. Now, one thing, uh, so Sellers so introduces the topic here. He makes light use of it, uh, but uh, it's worth remarking that uh, this is a theme that uh, he'll pick up later. Notice, though, to begin with, that if you have uh, the issue of how your semantic metavocabulary uh, is going to start off, what primitive concepts you're going to use, uh, it would be very dangerous to use the concept of representation uh, both for the relation that a declarative sentence stands in to the fact that it states, uh, and to use that same term, representation, for the relation between a name or a singular term uh, and what it refers to. If you begin uh, with what Michael Dummett calls the name bearer model of representation, uh, that has uh, the name Fido and then the dog Fido as your model of representation, uh, you should be careful not to assume that that's a good model for uh, the relation between the statement, the frog is on the log, and the fact that the frog is on the log, which it states or which makes it true. Uh, this is a question, what's the relation between naming and saying? Uh, it's not clear that one semantic model is uh, uh, going to work for both of them. You're going to have to tell a story about each of them about how they're related. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll read Seller's essay called Naming and Saying, uh, in which he uh, discusses this. In general, all of his treatments of introducing new terms by abstraction uh, turns on this naming and saying uh, issue. Uh, one of the traditions that treats naming as the semantic paradigm uh, is de Saussure's uh, uh, tradition that looks at signifiers and signifieds uh, as the fundamental semantic nexus uh, and doesn't acknowledge the Kantian lesson uh, that I referred to as the primacy of the propositional, the way in which uh, the use of uh, declarative sentences is, or by rights, ought to be first in the order of explanation of understanding contentfulness. Uh, and that's been something like the rock on which that tradition foundered, carried on from uh, the structuralists who were uh, impressed by de Saussure, uh, even to the post-structuralists. So that when uh, Derrida wants to reject this structuralist uh, semantic understanding of everything in terms of the relation between signifiers and signifieds, between terms and particulars, the best he can do is say, well, it's all relations among signifiers. Uh, that there is no uh, vertical relation to signifieds. And he wants to say, well, that's not a very radical rejection of this picture, just to pick sort of one element uh, of it. Uh, and I would say the same thing is true of uh, the semiotic tradition in Anglophone philosophy, 
uh, downstream from Hearst, but particularly from Charles Morris. Uh, again, uh, this tradition, going right back to the master uh, Hearst, uh, doesn't take sentences seriously enough. It runs with this uh, uh, name bearer model. Uh, semiotics mostly looks at variations of different species thought of as uh, signs, where the paradigm of a sign is the name of the dog and uh, the dog. Uh, and if you have a picture like that, you're always going to have Bradley's problem of how a bunch of names can get stuck together to say something. Uh, even if you say, well, some of those names are names for relations, uh, still, a sentence isn't just a list of names, some of which are names of particulars and some of which are names of relations. Well, how do they hang together? This was the question asked under the slogan of what is the unity of the proposition? Uh, well, if, as uh, Kant saw, uh, if that question is asked as part of an order of explanation that's coming from below, that's trying to understand saying exclusively in terms of naming relations, and just says, oh, but there's different kinds of things you can name. You can name relations, you can name facts, uh, and so on. Then there's a standing sort of structural problem that one is going to, uh, is going to have. Uh, so this is an issue we will uh, talk about um, uh, at considerable length later on. So I just need to be registering that uh, uh, this is an issue here. Now, on the other side, uh, Strawson complains about J.L. Austin uh, and his use of the notion of fact, that it leads Austin implausibly sort of metaphysical implausibility, uh, to introduce sentence-shaped objects into his picture of the world. Uh, and if you think about facts as sentence-shaped objects, they're weird. Uh, that, that's a strange kind of thing. But notice that that objection is assuming that facts are a kind of thing, that whatever is in the world is objects, and if you think facts are in the world, then you're thinking of facts as a kind of object, as a kind of particular. Uh, in fact, since I mentioned this for the record, uh, Austin's view of facts is subtler than that. Uh, after all, having a nuanced view is uh, Austin's superpower. Uh, here's passage uh, I think of when I think of Austin on facts. Uh, it's from How to Do Things with Words. He says, fact that is a phrase designed for use in situations where the distinction between a true statement and the state of affairs about which it is a truth is neglected, as it often is with advantage in ordinary life, though seldom in philosophy. Above all, in discussing truth, where it's precisely our business to prize words off of the world and keep them off of it. To ask, is the fact that S, that, is the fact that S, the true statement S, or that of which it is true of, to ask that question, may beget absurd, absurd answers. To take an analogy, though we may sensibly ask, do we ride the word elephant or the animal? and equally sensibly ask, do we write the word or the animal? It's nonsense to ask, do we define the word or the animal? For defining an elephant, elephants, supposing we ever do this, is a compendious description of an operation involving both word and animal. Do we focus the image or do we focus the battleship? And so speaking about the fact that is a compendious way of speaking about a situation involving both words and the world. That's the end of that long uh, quote from uh, 
Austin. Okay, so this is the second distinction uh, when we're talking about stuff that's happening out there. Uh, are we talking about particulars or are we talking about facts? Um, this comes up already in section three of EPM, where Seller says, the sense datum theorist, it would seem, must choose between saying, A, it's particulars which are sensed. Sensing is not knowing. The existence of sense data does not logically imply the existence of knowledge. That's what you can know is facts. It's sentence-shaped contents. Or B, sensing is a form of knowing. It's facts rather than particulars that are sensed. Now, you can see there's uh, a relation between these two distinctions as they apply uh, in this case. Um, a sensing can be a particular, even though what's sensed uh, is a fact. So uh, a way of thinking about the relation between the ing and the ed uh, and the particular and the fact uh, is that this is essential to the intentional nexus as we see it in uh, the sensing of a sense content or a believing uh, in relation to uh, what's believed uh, or what's uh, believable. Uh, so resolving that tension in three uh, that I've just mentioned in the passage from section three uh, is going to involve getting clearer about the relation between uh, acts and contents in intentional states like believings or sensings or Uh, so, so far, sort of the main lesson I want is uh, look how deftly Sellers is deploying these two distinctions uh, and how he's already cutting at serious joints in thinking about uh, how we describe what we're doing when we perceive something uh, by insisting on being clear about which side of each of these distinctions uh, we're working on. And the third distinction uh, that's in play here, uh, the one that's going to do most of the work for him, is the distinction in his terms between the epistemic and the non-epistemic. Uh, and by epistemic, of a pertaining to knowledge, well, but he means of a pertaining to justification. It's the justification condition on knowledge that uh, matters here. And for something to be epistemic uh, is for it to be able to justify or be justified. That is to stand in justificatory relations uh, to uh, other things. And what's non-epistemic uh, can't. Um, so uh, my realizing that I'm falling uh, can justify by doing things, uh, my falling can't justify anything. It can cause, uh, it can cause things. Okay, I think uh, with those uh, distinctions uh, in hand, we're ready to address the argument of the opening uh, sections, uh, in particular, particular section six and seven. Uh, all these passages are included in the ones that I extracted uh, and put on the uh, put on the handout, I put on the website. Um, so uh, in section six, uh, he says, it's clear that classical sense datum theor theories and let me say parenthetically, his picture of what he's doing here is starting with sort of the purest, uh, most barefaced version of givenness uh, in the form of sense data, which um, had been all the rage in Anglophone philosophy uh, 
in his father's generation, in Roy Wood uh, Sellers' generation, in the teens and the 20s, uh, and were still maintained by Sellers' Oxford teachers, uh, for instance, H.H. H. Price, uh, when he was there in the 30s. Uh, but you know, he's well aware that by the mid-50s, there really aren't any fans of uh, sense data anymore. Uh, this, but, but he talks about this because once we see the mistake involved in the sense datum theories, you think we'll be, be in a position to generalize it to uh, the notion of givenness uh, more generally. That's just a remark on the sort of rhetorical strategy here. He says, it seems clear that classical sense datum theories are confronted by an inconsistent triad made up of the three propositions, A, X senses a red sense content S, so now we're making the ing ed uh, distinction and keeping the sensing, X is sensing, separate from the red sense content S, but we're talking about this intentional constellation of, of them. X senses a red sense content S and tails X non-inferentially knows that S is red. So you have the sense datum, you are sensing redly uh, in the adverbial uh, phrase that Roderick Chisholm uh, preferred. Uh, you know that something's red. Uh, maybe not out there, but uh, in here. Uh, his emphasis on the classical sense datum uh, theory is because the sense datum inference uh, that was at the center of these theories was uh, if it seems to you or looks to you as though something is phi, there's always something that really is phi. Uh, it's just something in here, not something out there. It's the appearance, not the reality. Uh, now, you don't have to believe that. You don't have to endorse that inference uh, to be uh, committed to the framework of givenness, but that's a particularly pure, uh, a particularly pure one. Uh, so, one of their claims is: if you're in this sensory state of sensing a red sense content, uh, you know that that sense content is red uh, by having that experience. Uh, you know just of the sense data, not of anything else, but that it is red. B, second claim, the ability to sense sense contents is unacquired. Uh, just by uh, being wired up the way you are, uh, you can get red sense contents. Uh, so can birds. Can't talk at all, but they can sense uh, colored sense contents uh, as well. Uh, I always forget whether it's dogs or cats that are colorblind. But uh, uh, does anybody know off the top of here? It's dogs that are colorblind. Yeah. So you know your cat can, your, your dog can't. Uh, but they get it just by being a cat or a dog in good working order. Uh, that, that's not something they needed to learn how to do. C, third claim, the ability to know facts of the form X is phi is acquired. Um, say, well, this is um, inconsistent because the first uh, claim, the ability X senses a red sense content and tails S not in French, we know something. But the one ability, you don't have to learn anything to have, and the other ability, you do. Uh, so here he's using the question of acquisition to prize these things apart. Let me um, digress uh, just for a moment. Uh, Sellers talks about beating about in the neighboring bushes 
interesting there too. Uh, this notion of an inconsistent triad uh, doesn't particularly have anything to do with logic, uh, consistency in the sense of logic. Uh, that is, material inferences, inference of meaning, he says, there's implication relations uh, that hold not in virtue of logic, but just in virtue of the contents of uh, the concepts. It's raining so the streets will be wet. Not a logically good inference, but uh, the meanings of raining and wet uh, uh, make it a good one. Uh, well, that's not tr just true of reason relations of implication. It's true of reason relations of incompatibility as well. Uh, and it matters here that uh, it's not just the case that you can have uh, incompatible claims. Aristotelian contraries uh, are that. You can have irreducibly triadic incompatible claims. So the claim that uh, this thing in my hand is a blackberry, uh, that the thing in my hand is red, and the claim that it's ripe, uh, that's inconsistent. Uh, the children's slogan is because blackberries are red when they're green. That is, they're red when they're not ripe. Um, so I can't, if I claim that it's a blackberry, uh, it's red and it's ripe, uh, that's irreducibly, uh, an irreducibly incompatible triad. And by irreducible, I mean no two of those claims are uh, incompatible with each other. It can be a blackberry and red. Uh, it's just an unripe one. Uh, it can be red and ripe, uh, if it were a raspberry, uh, and it can be a blackberry and ripe, in which case it'll be black. Any two of those are compatible, but you put the three together and you have uh, an irreducibly uh, incompatible triad. Uh, logic lets you, if you have logical vocabulary, logical concepts, it's easy to generate these. Uh, P and Q and if P, then not Q, irreducibly uh, inconsistent. We can say now any two of them are consistent, but the triad isn't. But logic there is reflecting uh, material uh, incompatibilities, a more fundamental phenomenon. And of course, it's not just triads. There's uh, larger sets uh, of sentences that can be jointly incoherent as a, as a group. This goes beyond the, the notion of con contrariety, uh, that's the Aristotelian notion of material uh, incompatibility. I'll also mention going even deeper into the neighboring uh, bushes and more of a digression that uh, Sellers uh, wondered whether this was an essentially conceptual phenomenon, or whether it was also a perceptual phenomenon. And uh, is the author of what's uh, known as Seller's Challenge uh, among chefs who have no idea that he's a philosopher and uh, uh, does this. And this is the challenge to think of three foods or drinks such that any two of them uh, go well together, but the three of them don't. The three of them are horrible. By any setting of the standard between going well and being horrible, you can set it low if you like, but the dyads have to go on one side of that and the triad on the other half of that. And I'll mention that uh, when in 2012, uh, on the 100th anniversary of Sellers' birth. We had a Sellers' conference in, uh, in Dublin. And because uh, John McDowell was uh, flush with his um, uh, uh, melon money uh, from his Distinguished Achievement Award, uh, this was a very deluxe conference. And we set up tables where different groups uh, 
had their candidate for the seller's challenge. <laughs> uh, and uh, my candidate, uh, I think it's still undefeated, uh, I'll say, not necessarily uh, the best, uh, is beer, whiskey, and lemonade, uh, where people actually drink beer and whiskey, that's a boilermaker, they actually drink beer and uh, lemonade, um, uh, they drink whiskey and lemonade, that's a whiskey sour. Uh, the three of them are not good. <laughs> uh, so I claim. Uh, at, at any rate, this is something you can think about. Uh, Sellers raised the question uh, because he suspected that these irreducible triads and larger groups of uh, items uh, is a specifically conceptual uh, phenomenon, not uh, one of our senses, uh, but exclusively one of the intellect. Now, he never resolved that to his uh, satisfaction, and I'm not going to address it uh, further here. Uh, I only mention this to, I don't know, enrich the background a little for his argument that uh, this was an inconsistent triad. You'll find often in his articles, uh, his diagnosis of philosophical positions is that we're faced with uh, an inconsistent or incoherent triad, uh, and that gives us an agenda, All right, Well, which one of them are we going to, uh, are we going to give up? Okay, well, he has a diagnosis of what's gone wrong. Uh, the first lesson that we can learn from uh, the inconsistent triad that he's uh, saddled the uh, fan of classical sense data with, uh, he says, what we have here is the mongrelization of two good lines of thought. Uh, there, there's two good ideas, uh, but they're being run together. Uh, that's the trouble. Uh, and the one line of thought uh, just has to do with the causal antecedents of perceptual knowledge, and the other has to do with justification. So if we think about going back to, to Kant, um, complaining that in place of epistemology, the celebrated Mr. Locke has given us only a physiology of the human understanding, uh, an account of the causal mechanisms that lead us to knowledge in place of an account of what justifies the claims uh, that we have, quid factus, quid juris. Um, uh, fundamental Kantian distinction. So in section seven, Seller says, it certainly begins to look as though the classical concept of a sense datum were a mongrel resulting from the crossbreeding of two ideas. One, the, ideas, the idea that there are certain inner episodes, sensations of red or C flat, which can occur to human beings and brutes without any prior process of learning or concept formation, and without which it would in some sense be impossible to see, for instance, that the facing surface of a physical object is red and triangular, or hear that a certain physical sound is a C-flat. And second, the other idea, that there are certain inner episodes which are non-inferential knowings, that certain items are, for instance, red or C-flat, and that these episodes are the necessary conditions of empirical knowledge as providing the evidence for all other empirical propositions. So the first one says, look, if we look at the causal chains that lead to my knowing that there's a red octagonal stop sign in front of me, 
uh, we're going to say, well, it depends on there being these sensory episodes. If you didn't have them, if you were one of the 10% of human males who was red, green, colorblind, uh, you didn't have that uh, sensing of a red sense content, uh, then you couldn't come uh, perceptually to know that there was a red octagonal surface uh, in front of you, at least not that way. Uh, you couldn't see it. That's a matter of the physiology of the understanding. That's the sort of thing that physiologists of perception study. And that's respectable, uh, no complaint about that. But it shouldn't be run together, he's saying, with the idea that there's certain inner episodes that are non-inferential knowings uh, that something is red and octagonal that justifies my claim, say, that there's a stop sign there. Uh, you ask me why, and I say, well, look, it's red, it's octagonal. Um, that's the uh, shape and color of stop signs. Uh, that's my evidence if I have to if I have to back away from it uh, and and give reasons. So I think uh, though Sellers doesn't uh, do this, I think it's fair to paraphrase his argument. Uh, if we think, look, there's four things. There's the physical world, there's sensings of sense contents, there's perceptually acquired beliefs, non-inferentially acquired beliefs, and then there's inferential beliefs. Uh, so there's three transitions between these, and Sellers elsewhere uses the helpful notion of B causation. Uh, codified in the use of the word because. Uh, it's because the physical world is the way it is, there's that uh, red octagonal surface visible in front of me. It's because the physical world is that way uh, that I sense the sense contents that I do. And it's because I sense the sense contents that I do that I acquire the non-inferential belief. I non-inferentially acquire the perceptual belief that there's something red and octagonal in front of me. And it's because I have that non-inferentially acquired belief that I can infer and justify the claim that there's a stop sign. So there's three becauses in that, because the physical world is the way it is, sense contents are the way they are, because the sense contents are the way they are, the non-inferential belief is as it is, and because the non-inferential belief is the way it is, my inferential beliefs are the way they are. And that first because is clearly causal dispositional. Oh. It's because there's that visible red facing octagonal surface that I have, uh, that I sense the sense content that I do. That's a reliable, uh, reliably co-varying causal chain connecting me, uh, connecting my states to uh, the external world. Again, the sort of thing that a physiologist of perception, uh, say, you know, in the classic paper, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain, uh, is going to be studying. And it's clear that the third because, the one that connects the perceptually acquired belief, the non-inferentially acquired belief, to inferential beliefs that it justifies, that's clearly a justificatory because uh, the perception, you say, well, why do you believe there's a stop sign? Well, I can see it. I can see this octagonal red uh, surface. I'm expressing you know, that 
perceptually acquired belief, its relation to uh, the things that uh, are conclusions I can draw from it is a justificatory, epistemic in his term, relation. So the kicker is that middle because the one that's connecting the sensing of a sense content to a non-inferential belief. Is that just a causal connection or is it a justificatory connection? And that's what he's putting the pressure on with this question of, of acquisition uh, is about uh, that move because uh, the sensing of the sense content is something you get for being wired up the way you are. You didn't need to learn anything for that. But having the non-inferential belief that something is read, he says, no, you've got to have concepts uh, for that. That's something uh, conceptual. Uh, so we're talking about uh, this. We're looking at some of the delicacies of really the interface between the non-conceptual and uh, the conceptual here. Now, that's to say that, that I think in the argument that uh, the sense datum theorist has got a problem in the middle there, uh, the sort of thing, the cartoon of the uh, prof at the board writing equations, equations, and equations, equations below, but in between it says, and here the magic happens. Uh, that that's what the uh, sense datum theorist has got. Uh, but if we apply that second distinction here, we can say, and something like this is what Sellers wants to say, well, you could think that the relation between the way the world is and the sensing, the act, is a causal one but that the relation between what sensed, the content of the sensing, uh, and the non-inferential belief was a justificatory one. Uh, if you could split the difference that way, uh, then an intermediary that was brought about causally, but which could stand in justificatory relations, uh, if we can make sense of a kind of uh, state uh, whose content is genuinely conceptual. And Sellers is going to uh, have a conception like that. Um, we'll see sort of how this goes. It's, it's in this myth of Jones uh, in the second half uh, uh, of the essay. Um, uh, about how this uh, how this works. Uh, it's about the relation between uh, sense impressions that are, which for him are not conceptual at all, uh, and uh, non-inferential beliefs, uh, which are. Um, that's that's sort of the challenge. Oh, yeah. So really, I want to say what's doing the work is the distinction between the epistemic and the non-epistemic, or between the conceptual and the non-conceptual. Um, asking of each of these transitions, is it merely causal or is it justificatory? Now, remember I mentioned in connection with sort of neo-Kantianism generally, uh, be careful how sharp you make this distinction or it's in danger of turning into a dualism when, you know, and it will if you can't tell any story about how something could be amphibious or uh, could connect these two realms. Um, and, and that's why beginning with the distinction between uh, acts of sensing and sensibles uh, on the one hand, and seeing that the act of sensing could be a particular, while what sensed could be uh, conceptually
articulate. It could be fact-like. Uh, it gives us some hope that, that we're not stuck with uh, a dualism. Um, now, this argument is to open up into uh, a diagnosis of what's wrong with the framework of givenness uh, in general. And what's wrong with it is that it doesn't appreciate the Kantian distinction between uh, the conceptual and the non-conceptual, between uh, what's uh, in the order of justification uh, what stands in relations of implication uh, uh, to other such conceptually contentful stuff on the one hand uh, and what's just there on the other hand. Uh, the purest form of givenness is the idea that there's some sort of state uh, that is a kind of knowing uh, or can serve as a reason or justification for believing, uh, but that doesn't require you to have uh, acquired concepts uh, by coming into the language. Uh, that just by its occurrence in you constitutes knowledge apart from your conceptual capacities generally. That's the idea of givenness. And Sellers, so ultimate diagnosis of this, I think, uh, is that there's a notion of non-inferential beliefs uh, that we need to be very careful with, and people haven't been careful enough. There's two senses in which a belief might be non-inferential. One is that the believing might be non-inferential. That is, you didn't come into this state of believing as the result of a process of inference from something else. But the other sense in which you might think a belief could be non-inferential is that having it doesn't depend on its inferential connections to any other beliefs. And he wants to say there aren't any non-inferential beliefs in that sense. Because what's believed, a believable, is essentially, and not just accidentally, conceptually articulated and that conceptual articulation consists in its being situated in a space of implications that relates it to other conceptually contentful items. To be a believable or a claimable or a knowable content is to be situated in a space of implications. Um, So if by non-inferential belief you mean a belief you could have even though you didn't have any other beliefs or didn't know anything about what followed from what, even though you didn't have any other concepts, uh, no, that's impossible. Uh, having one belief or one concept, that's the sound of one hand clapping. They only come as a whole group, the concepts and the beliefs. So believings can be non-inferential when we're talking about their causal antecedents. How did you arrive at this believing? Well, some of them I arrive at as the result of a process of inference, and others I arrive at as the result of a process of perception, rather than inference. Uh, it makes sense to talk about non-inferential believings, but believables, to talk about the content uh, of that, the thing that can stand in justificatory relations to other believables, the thing that can serve as a reason for others, that has to be 
situated in a space of implications. That is, it has to be inferentially articulated. Now, believables, what's believed, the contents, can't be non-inferential. But if you just use the notion of belief uh, and talk about non-inferential beliefs, uh, you're making yourself a patsy for uh, the mistake of givenness, uh, for falling into uh, the myth of the given. Now, all of that I mean as a uh, philosophical background for the story of looks, which is how uh, I think the most astonishing, Seller's story here, I think is the most astonishing philosophical move I know. Uh, certainly in uh, near contemporary times. So let me try and tell the story in a way that uh, maybe can make you uh, feel some of the resonances that I do with this. Uh, let's start off with Descartes. Uh, he famously read his ontology off of his epistemology. Uh, and in doing that, adopted uh, a platonic order of explanation. Because uh, the origin of this uh, methodology, this explanatory strategy, uh, is Plato, uh, who distinguishes things that you can know by your senses and things you can know by your intellect. What distinguishes the realm of becoming from the realm of being uh, is the epistemological the sort of epistemological access that we have to things. In Descartes' case, the big ontological distinction isn't between sensible things and intelligible things. Indeed, one of the astonishing things for his contemporaries about Descartes' notion of a pensée, uh, of a thought, uh, is that that's a genus that includes sensible and intelligible species. Uh, Picture-like things as well as sentence-like things, as, as we might uh, put it. No, for him, the distinction was between things we could make mistakes about and things we couldn't. Things we knew incorrigibly, those were mental things, uh, and things we only knew uh, in a fallible, uh, in a fallible way. He had a theory about this, that the world was divided into things that were by nature representings. That was the mental stuff. And things that by nature could only be represented. Between representings and representables, uh, if you will. And that the merely representable stuff we're fallible about because we know it by representing it and we can misrepresent it. What's represented may not be as the representing has it. The reality may not be as it appears. The reality is what's represented. Uh, the representings of it, the appearance may not uh, be veridical. Uh, but uh, those representings are self-illuminating. 
You know them not by representing them, but just by having them. Now, having events in your mind is to know them. Now, what's in your mind you can't be wrong about, now, because you don't know it by representing it, and so you can't misrepresent it. Uh, and you can't be ignorant about it. Uh, if it's going on in your mind, you know it. Uh, there isn't any gap between it's happening and your knowing. It's happening is your knowing that it's happening. It's an act of awareness, of immediate awareness. And I suggested we could uh, assimilate the implicit argument here to a semantic, specifically representational version of the Agrippan trilemma, uh, now not having to do with justification, but with representation, uh, that leads to the conclusion that uh, if error is to be possible, then there must be something about which error is impossible. Uh, if we can know anything fallibly, there must be something we can know infallibly. Because diagnosis of error, of how there can be a gap between appearance and reality, uh, is that the appearance is a representing, the reality is what's represented, and they can be out of step. Uh, they can be a, a misrepresenting. But uh, if we ask how we know the representing, well, if we can only know it by representing it, uh, we're off on a potential infinite regress where we don't actually know anything, or we've got some kind of a circle, which is no better, or there's a kind of representing that you know not by representing it, but just by having it immediately not mediated by a representing of it. And he has, so, so this is high theory, uh, astonishing new uh, view, but that's the basis, that is the epistemic basis for his ontological um, assimilation uh, and his assimilation in the philosophy of mind uh, of uh, perception-like things and belief-like things, uh, products of the senses and products of the intellect, because you know, I know that things look red, uh, and I know that uh, I think that's a horse. Uh, I don't know whether it is red. I don't know whether it is a horse, but I know what I think. I know what it looks like to me. One of the famous 17th century examples is uh, a square tower seen in the distance. It looks round. You can't see the difference between the faces and the corners in it. Oh, uh, well, I take the distant tower to be round. The reality isn't. It's square. Oh, uh, so there's a difference between how I take it and how it is, how it appears to me, and how it is. Oh, he says, my representing and the represented there. You say, well, can't the same thing happen with your representing? You say, it appears round, but maybe it really is red. Well, how do you know it appears round? Maybe that isn't how it appears. Maybe it only appears to appear round. No, I know how it appears. You, you ask me and I'll tell you it's round. That I can't be mistaken about in the way I can be mistaken about how it really is. I can't be mistaken about the way it appears to me. Well, Descartes has this theory of representation and error that is uh, an explanation of that. And that's a, a brilliant theory. Sellers in less than 10 paragraphs demolishes it. He says, it's dead wrong. It's as wrong as it conceivably could be. 
As I say, he does this in a few paragraphs. So let's look at him do this. Oh. In section 14, he gives us the parable of John in the tie shop. We've got myths, we've got parables uh, here. John works in the tie shop. Uh, people come in, they want ties of a certain color. Oh, I should say, there used to be these things, neckties, and people would go to stores and buy them. Um, that's sort of as far off as the days before uh, electric lights here, but uh, Sellers still lives in that world. He says, this tie's green, this tie's blue, this tie's purple, everything's fine. Uh, then they introduce uh, electric lights, and it turns out uh, a new kind of mistake that didn't used to come up becomes possible. Uh, Somebody comes in, wants a green tie. Oh, let me get it right. Here's a handsome green one. Uh, John says, well, let's see how it looks outside. North sky daylight. That's the conditions under which things look like what they are. They take it out. This is outside. No, no, this is blue. Oh, well, maybe taking it outside changed the color of it. Well, that never used to happen for the electricity. Uh, is it that the electricity turns blue ties green? Well, that would be really funny, too. Uh, don't know what to say. Uh, come back a couple months later, uh, and he says, uh, John has learned to say, comes in for a green tie. Uh, well, is this a green one? He says, well, it looks green, uh, but let's take it outside and see whether it really is green. Uh, and sometimes it turns out, no, it's really blue. Sometimes it turns out, yeah, it, it is green. It, it, it looked the way it is. Um, now, how are we to understand that change? Uh, so let's just understand it this way. Uh, John used to be a reliable reporter of green things in his shop. But the circumstances have changed. Uh, there's a new kind of error, a new kind of riskiness about this. Uh, he's not as reliable as he was. He knows that if he's looking at it under electric light, as opposed to north sky daylight, that he's liable to make a certain kind of mistake. Uh, that his inclinations to call it green can't be trusted uh, under these non-standard conditions, the newfangled uh, electric lights. So what does he do? What is he, I, I want to put it this way, what is he doing when he says, it looks green, but maybe it merely looks green and isn't really green. What's he doing? Well, when he confidently says outside, okay, it's blue. We can both see that it's blue. It's a blue tie. These are the conditions. We're both reliable blue discriminators. Uh, we can tell. He's doing two things. He's exercising a reliable capacity to respond differentially to blue things. And he's exercising that capacity by making a claim, endorsing a believable. He's staking his claim, making the claim that it's blue. There are these two components. One is his exercise of a reliable disposition to discriminate blue things from non-blue things. That's something he might share with the parrot or the cat. Uh, he can respond differentially to blue things reliably under the 
the right conditions. But he can do something that the cat and the parrot can't do. He can exercise that uh, capacity, not just by pressing a certain button. Um, he can do that by making a claim, by taking up a position in the space uh, of reasons. Uh, something that can itself be appealed to as a reason for other things. Because it's blue, it'll go with that suit. That's an inference that he can make from it. But he's learned that he's fallible in his previously reliable differential responsive disposition. Under these circumstances, he makes mistakes a lot. So he says, well, it may not be blue, but it looks blue. Maybe it merely looks blue. Uh, what I am willing to say is it looks blue. I think I should shift it from green. Uh, it looks blue. No, let me go back. It looks green. That's what he says. We'll take it outside and see whether it is. Here he is expressing, evincing, or manifesting his disposition to respond to this by calling it blue. Sorry, by calling it green. If he didn't know there was funny business going on, he would indulge this disposition and would just say, it's green. That's what he used to do. But now knowing that uh, he's prone to making these mistakes, uh, he expresses his temptation to call it green, but he doesn't succumb to the temptation. He explicitly withholds his endorsement. By not saying it is green, but just saying it looks green. He hasn't made a claim about what color it is. He's only expressed his temptation to make a claim, but has explicitly withheld his commitment to its being green. Now, why is it that he can't be wrong when he says it looks green? When we say, well, maybe it doesn't really look green. Maybe it only looks to look green, or appears to look green, or seems to look green. Well, what would that be if you said it, it appears to look green, or it seems to me to look green? Maybe it merely seems to me to look green. It doesn't really look green. It merely seems to me to look green. Well, you'd be, on this account, manifesting your temptation to say that it looked green, but withholding the commitment. But what commitment? You've already withheld the only commitment in the vicinity, the commitment to its being green. When you said it looks green, you haven't claimed what color it is. And that was the only commitment in the vicinity. There isn't, you're not undertaking a commitment, uh, you're withholding one. And so there's nothing for you to withhold with that second use of looks. That's why um, looks claims, claims about how things appear, are incorrigible, not because they're reports of a special kind of thing, appearances about which you can't be wrong, but because they're not reports of anything. They're expressions of a temptation or a disposition to make a report about how things are out there, which you have reason to resist and are explicitly resisting. You've withheld the only commitment there is 
uh, that you could make. That's why you're infallible. But look at that infallibility, which is a matter of withholding commitment. That's exactly not something that you can do with what Descartes went on to do with his immediate awareness of representings, namely to use that semantic response to that version of the Agrippan trilemma to respond to the epistemological justificatory one, to say, aha, then here's my foundational epistemological project. Let's justify all of our risky claims about the represented world by tracing them all back by infallible chains of reasoning to claims about how things are in my mind, to how things are with my representings, the things I can't be wrong about. That was Descartes' project. Once he had found that there were some things he couldn't be wrong about, namely the contents of his own mind, then let's reconstruct claims about how things are out there in a sort of phenomenalist mode, uh, so as to trace back our ultimate warrant for those to the things that aren't risky claims, that we can't be wrong about. And as I say, that was a, a brilliant analysis of and use of this fact that looks talk, seems talk, appears talk doesn't iterate. Uh, one use of it, you get a distinction between how things are and how they merely appear or look, but you can't apply that to how things merely appear or look. The distinctions collapse. If it seems to you that it seems red, then it seems red. There isn't that gap between seems to seem, appears to appear, and just appears. But far from showing that claims about how things appear or look or seem is uh, the most certain knowledge, it's just showing that it's not in the knowledge business at all. It's not expressing a belief. Descartes got things turned on their head uh, because he's got a wrong account of what you're doing when you say how things look or appear. He doesn't understand the commitment withholding aspect of them. Now, let me mention three phenomena in the vicinity that um, Sellers mentions that are confirmatory evidence for this diagnosis of what you're doing in making a look statement. One of them is third person looks. You know, I was talking about what you're doing if you say how things look to you. What am I doing when I talk about how things look to you? I say, oh, uh, John says uh, that the tie is green, but the tie isn't really green. It merely looks green to John. And this is, uh, Sellers talks about this in section 15. What am I doing when I say, John says the tie is green, and I say, no, it merely looked green to him. He undertook a commitment, and I'm attributing that commitment to him but I'm withholding endorsement from it. When I say, he said it's green, he expressed his belief that it's green, so I'm attributing the belief to him that he undertook. But when I say, but he's wrong, it merely looks green to him, what I'm doing is withholding my endorsement of that claim. I'm saying, but it isn't green, it's blue. So he endorsed it, but I'm expressing that I don't endorse it by my using looks. That's what I'm doing when I use looks to talk about him. It's essentially the, the third person version of what I'm doing when I use looks. Okay, that's a bit of confirmatory evidence about this endorsement withholding analysis of looks or appears talk. Second thing, another famous 17th and 18th century uh, example, the chiliagon. Uh, the polygon 
regular polygon that has a thousand sides. Does it look as though it has a thousand sides? Or does it just look many sided? Maybe it looks like it has more than a hundred sides and fewer than 10,000 sides. Oh, now that's a hard thing for the sense theorist, sense datum theorist. Remember, they make the inference if there's something that looks phi out there, then there's something in here that really is phi. What, the sense datum is merely many-sided? It, it has some number of sides between 500 and 10,000, but does it look 1,000-sided? No, it does not look 1,000-sided. It doesn't look 99-sided, 999-sided. There's no particular number of those large numbers of sides that it looks to have, but it looks to be many-sided. The hen looks speckled. How many specks does it look as though the hen has? Well, it looks to have a lot of speckles. Now, no actual hen can just have a lot of speckles. They have to have some particular number. Each polygon has to have some definite number of sides. Well, what am I doing when I say it looks many-sided? Yeah, it looks like it has more than 500 and fewer than 10,000 sides. That's what it looks like. Well, I'm withholding commitment to its having any particular number of sides. I know I can't tell. I'm willing to commit myself to it having more than 500 sides. Let's say I'm willing to commit myself to it having less than 10,000 sides, willing to commit myself to it being many-sided. That's as far as my commitment is willing to go. But I withhold the commitment to its having 999 sides, to its having a thousand sides, to its having a thousand and one side, those commitments I'm not willing to make. Withholding, I can withhold, as it were, some of the commitment and not others. That's what I'm doing when I say it looks many-sided, looks to have between 500 and 10,000 sides. Now, what's being calibrated there is what am I willing to commit myself to, to endorse, and what am I not? What am I withholding? Again, so, so that's the generic lookings, merely generic lookings uh, case. Again, scoped lookings. There's a red apple over there. That's one claim I could make. Oh, there looks to be a red apple over there. That's another claim I can make. But I can also say the apple over there looks red. Now, only part of the claim is within the scope of the looks. What am I doing? I'm committing myself to its being an apple, which I don't do if I say there looks to be a red apple over there. There, I've withheld the whole commitment. Not committed to its being an apple, not committed to its being red. But uh, I can also say, with intermediate scope, that apple over there looks red. I have some reason to think I might be wrong about the color, but I'm, you know, I'm sure it's an apple. I'm willing to commit myself to its being an apple. I withhold commitment to the color. That apple over there looks red. There looks to be a red apple over there, or there's a red apple over there. Uh, if you're thinking about incorrigibility of appearances, what are you going to say about these intermediate scoped? Cases. So here's Seller's argument. I mean, it's an account. Uh, he's saying, think about how looks talk works. Think about, and I've emphasized this without saying why, think about what you're doing when you make a looks claim. Uh, rather than thinking about, as it were, what you're saying, the content uh, of it, uh, because you're doing these two things, acknowledging that if you didn't know any better, 
you're sort of in just the sort of situation where if you didn't think there was some funny business going on, you would endorse the claim that it's red. Uh, but presumably because you do have some reason to believe there's funny business going on, you're not willing to make that claim. You're not willing to endorse that. That's a plausible diagnosis of how looks talk works that explains generic looking, scoped lookings, the third person attributions uh, of lookings. It's a plausible diagnosis. It explains the incorrigibility of looks claims, of claims about appearances. Uh, explains why those operators, looks, seems, appears, don't iterate. Why the distinction between is and looks makes a real distinction where you might, uh, you know, the one, the claim it is red might be true uh, and it look and it looks red is false, mostly the other way around, that it is red is false, looks red is true. Uh, but it seems to me that it looks red, and it looks red, they get truth valued together. You don't get the same kind of distinction there. That failure of iteration, which is the incorrigibility of uh, look statements, uh, is accounted for on this uh, endorsement withholding view. But on that account, it's at the cost of it not being an expression of knowledge or belief. That's not what you're doing. You've withheld the only endorsement that there is in the vicinity, which means it's precisely not suited, these looks claims, to be a foundation for knowledge. Well, I mean, there are obviously complications uh, about this uh, line of argument. But uh, I am as in awe of this philosophical move that Sellers makes in these few paragraphs today as I was 50 years ago when I first read it. There's this massive Cartesian project and that shaped the whole of modern philosophy. I mean, of course, it had its vicissitudes uh, over the last 350 years. But that Cartesian argument and analysis is really what kicked off the modern philosophical enterprise. Uh, and so it's just, well, let me show you how this really works. Don't think that way anymore. Uh, it was just a fundamental mistake to think that these claims were claims about a special kind of thing that had this peculiar metaphysical property that the one whose appearances they are can't be wrong about them. Reifying the thing you're making claims about when you say how things look, you're really not making claims about a special kind of thing. You're doing something relative to claims about what there really is, about reality. That's what appearings So, uh, for me, this is the sort of philosophical move I say, yes, I would like at some point in my life to make a philosophical move like that. Uh, I mean, that one's been done. Uh, what does like that mean? Well, in your philosophical education, I urge you to get a collection of moves that are like that in the sense that you just say, yes, now I feel like I understand something I didn't understand before. Uh, and that is a complete uh, turning over of one way of thinking uh, for another. And I'll see not without issues that it raises, but uh, I think it's very hard to confront that uh, analysis of uh, looks talk uh, and you know 
not be moved by it to, to want to rethink on these issues. Yeah. I've timed this so it's break time. Uh, so let's take our break now. But that will give you time to mull this over a little bit, and we can have questions and discussion about it uh, when we come back. OK. Having promised for the questions, there's one more thing I want to say before. Uh, and this is uh, a sort of final uh, gesture that Seller says, so there's one thing that I can agree with the, um, that I can agree with the um, sense datum people about, with the phenomenalists about, uh, and that is that the claim uh, X is red uh, means X would look red under standard conditions, that that claim is analytic. That is true by definition. Now, the phenomenalist wants to use that to analyze X is red in terms of X looks red. Uh, and I say, well, look, if you admit that this is analytic, I'm just defining X is red in terms of X would look red under standard conditions. You agree that's true by definition. And Seller says, yes, I do. But not the definition of red. It's the definition of standard conditions. Standard conditions are, by definition, the conditions under which things look to have the colors that they do have. Standard conditions means where there's no funny business that would lead you to or justify you in withholding endorsements. So again, he said, there's something, you know, you guys were right about. Uh, X is red means, by definition, X would look red under standard conditions. But it's not a definition of red. It's a definition of standard conditions. So again, he's turned around the datum that uh, motivated this phenomenalist program. Okay, Thomas, you've been. <laughs> I just thinking of what's going on in your client base. So it says it looks green. You go outside, it, it is blue. He sees, okay, no, it's blue. I, you know, the, the new lighting, I wasn't sure about it. I don't, you know, I'm not reliable. Reporter of colors of ties under that. But if he went back inside and looked at the tie, he'd think, well, I know it's blue, but damn, it, it looks green. But I know it's not green. I know that because I saw it in the standard conditions and it's blue. So how, how would, you know, on, on this picture, how do you make sense of the looks pop there despite, you're not withholding, he, sure, he might be withholding commitment to it's green, but he explicitly knows it's not green. So is there a tension there about the idea of withholding something? Well, I mean, Sellers, you know, he's still expressing, he's still tempted. You know, he's, he's still moved by his training to call it green. Um, uh, Sellers paraphrases this uh, in uh, 14, 15, and 16, saying, uh, look, it's just like the situations in which I call it green. Uh, sort of from, from where I am, I can't tell the difference between this case, in which I actually know it's not green, and the cases where I would see that it's green. Uh, these are indistinguishable uh, by me. Uh, but I know these aren't standard conditions. It's those uh, funny lights. So you know, I know better than to acquire the belief that it's green here. But yeah. In saying that, he's expressing that it's a situation that's indistinguishable as far as his reliable differential responsive dispositions are concerned uh, from the case in which it really is green. He's not saying that, of course. That's not the content of what he's saying, that it's indistinguishable from and so on. That, that's why I wanted to put it in terms of what he's doing. Uh, because looks talk is funny. and you're not really making claims. It's not a report of something different. It's not a report. 
All right. I'm just, I'm puzzled. What about a center line? It looks the way it looks. Like, is, is that, you know, it's not clear to me that that sort of looks off in the way that it looks green. Well, I mean, maybe, you know, the question about it looks the way it looks, maybe that is a report, uh, a way of saying uh, that it's indistinguishable from the cases where uh, uh, it really is green. Um, I mean, that's cer certainly closer uh, to, that, to that case. I mean, I should also say uh, there are other uses of looks than this uh, uh, commitment withholding one. Uh, I mean, I, the third person cases are not sort of who's withholding it in the third person case. You know, when I say, oh, you think it's blue, but it only, you think it's green, but it only looks green to you. In that case, I'm the one who's withholding the endorsement. But there's others, uh, oh, I was just, Oh, having my eyes checked for new glasses yesterday, he put those drops in my eyes. And when I came out, everything looked blurry. Oh, well, that's not a withholding of uh, an endorsement. That's closer to uh, a description of how it is for me. Oh, I think what, what one's saying under those circumstances is something like, oh, it's like uh, a blurred photograph uh, or something, uh, something there. Uh, I mean, that sort of case um, uh, is one I can imagine people being tempted by the sense datum inference and saying, well, then there must be something that is blurry, the, the image or something, uh, or something like that. But I think those are just different uh, uses, um, because that isn't, I'm not expressing a temptation to think the world is blurry. Uh, no, it's, it's as though I were seeing it through a, you know, a blurring medium or something. Yeah. Just kind of a follow-up on all of these questions. Um, so in the John case, time in which appearances were reality, and then you know, that side station was broken. Um, the real world isn't like that, and it doesn't really seem that um, any of us have been trained to report, uh, you know, that make reports of things exactly as they look. It seems like there was, was never that time when you were trained to make those reports. Um, so that's kind of a preliminary for my main question, which is whether this account relies on this empirical assumption that all of us have these inclinations to report that things are um, uh, the way our, you know, we have these, we have inclinations to report that things are certain ways, and that we withhold these in precisely all those cases, and then we say, and we say that things look a certain way. And it seems to me that if, that's, if we have to rely on this assumption, well, it's not just that assumption. It's the assumption also that these inclinations are triggering our looks off, our looks report. So we actually have two assumptions. That there's, I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's two assumptions. One is that we have these inclinations. Second is that the inclinations are just somehow causally responsible for our looks off. And it seems to me that there are, if there are cases which would um, uh, put a lot of pressure on those assumptions. So um, if I have a, a very tall friend who walks away in the distance, um, this is like a very ordinary situation in which I would say, well, he looks really small. Um, but um, it doesn't really seem that I am at all inclined to say that my friend is smaller. Um, it seems like these kind of situations are such a part of everyday life that it's really hard for me to think that there are these um, inclinations. So I'm curious whether there is some sort of assumption. So, I mean, certainly Sellers is dramatizing by giving us the uh, picture of a one-time change of circumstance with the introduction of the 
you know, of the new lights. I mean, I mentioned the uh, square towers looking round in the distance. Um, you know, th that's a case where people learn not to trust uh, their inclinations to describe the shapes of things if they're far off, because as you ride closer, uh, you're inclined to say different things uh, about them. And so that there you might say, well, it looks round, but I know, you know, I can't tell the shapes of things at this distance. Uh, you know, what is one saying then? Well, if I was in the situation I'm in now and was closer to it, I'd report that it was round. But I know I'm not reliable at this distance, so uh, you know I won't say that. So I mean I think uh, it's certainly true that we learn as part of our non-inferential reporting uh, uh, practices, sort of when to be cagey about it, when not to uh, trust our inclinations, uh, and, and that's an integral part of the. Uh, of the practice, it doesn't seem to me he's falsifying um, uh, anything about it. That is, there's what we would say in an unguarded moment, uh, and then there's what we would say if we have some reason to believe that there might be funny business. Um, and, and, and that's really when the, well, it looks like that to me. Uh, is the is the sort of fallback? Right. I mean, I think one needs to be very careful if one is running the Salarzian line not to do that. And one of the reasons uh, uh, I'm not quoting everything that he says is I think he skirts very close to that. He's happy to, to paraphrase this as um, oh, I'm expressing that my perceptual situation is just as a perceptual situation indistinguishable from one in which, and sometimes even to say, uh, my experience is indistinguishable just as an experience from, now he doesn't mean uh, experiences as things that come by, he means sort of my whole take, perceptual take, uh, on things. Uh, when we get the genius Jones and his constructive myth, we're going to find out that uh, what triggers, what's the occasion for Jones' myth is he wants an explanation of why it is that things, that blue things look green to John in the tie shop. Uh, why is the why can't he distinguish the situation uh, of looking at uh, a green thing in the electric light and looking at a green thing uh, in north sky daylight standard conditions? Why can't he tell those apart? And the answer is, uh, well, there's something that's common. There are sense impressions that he has, and the electric light is. Uh, initiating a causal chain that produces sense impressions in him which are indistinguishable by him from the sense impressions he gets uh, that are brought about by a different causal chain initiated by by blue but by genuinely green things uh, and now we need to worry about well what's the relation between his uh, 
sense impressions and any awareness that he has uh, of anything. Uh, and the, the story of the myth of Jones is how we could understand that to be the explanation in people who were not aware of their sense impressions, except in the sense that they could respond differentially to them. Uh, and then how, uh, and this is really Joan's genius, how we could come to have the right concepts and come to be able to be aware, not just of uh, the tie, but of the sense impression. Um, but it, it's an essential part of that story that that awareness of the sense impression comes late in the development. And for them to be an explanation of our making these mistakes, they don't need to be things we're aware of uh, any more than changes in layer three of our visual cortex, which a physiologist of perception might use to explain why you know, we make certain kinds of mistakes. Um, but their account doesn't depend on our knowing what's going on in level layer three of the visual cortex. So that's something we'll talk about more next time. Well, so Oh, sometimes, sometimes, for instance, in standard conditions, things look like what they are. Uh, and then there's no, there's no uh, uh, endorsement withholding uh, going on. Uh, it's blue. It looks blue. Uh, both of those. Uh, I'm saying it's look, it looks blue. Um, is evincing, manifesting, expressing my temptation to call it blue, which I am then indulging in. Uh, the withholding is the merely looks um, uh, locution. So when I'm in third person attributing the claim and say, uh, John claims that, that it's green, that he can see it's green, but it merely looks green to him. Uh, merely looks green. I'm withholding endorsement, but it isn't. But it isn't really green. Uh, but I could say, but when he takes it out outside, he claims it's green. He can see that it's uh, green, uh, and he can see that it's green. You know, it looks green to him, but it doesn't merely look green. This is one of the cases where it looks green, and uh, it is. It is green. Uh, so. You know, in that formula about the standard conditions, uh, is read by definition, something is read by definition, if it would look read under standard conditions, that's telling us normally those things go together. Well, normally that's the definition of standard conditions when things look the way they are. Uh, but, but then why do we need you know, both locutions? Well, because there's non-standard conditions. And in the non-standard conditions, they come apart. And that's when the withholding uh, takes place. So uh, you know, that's why there's two things to say there is because of the cases that come, that come apart. Yes. Because you were just now starting to talk about sort of these electromagnetic waves and stuff. It seems to me that this is physical explanation is so dependent on the definition of what are standard conditions. And so sort of like when you think about the light and the if you want to, if you want to say, okay, standard conditions color, like things are really blue if they are blue in the daylight on Earth, which is this far from the sun and that you know emits light. Particular sort of um, structure of the sun, blah blah blah. 
you know, that's all very sort of dependent on what we think the true color really is. Like we could be in a different solar system with a different sun, and the same objects would appear different under standard physics conditions, with our sort of vision. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I want to say that that's special to the color, uh, to the color case because the question of what it is for something to be green is such a complicated uh, question that depends on our physiology as well. And it's a response-dependent property. Uh, it isn't just a matter of but the. Well, okay, it, in that case, but in general, what colors things are is not just a matter of their reflectance or the um, wavelength of the light that's coming to us. It interacts with our physiology in all these complicated, uh, in all these complicated ways. Uh, so that, for instance, I mean, this is unweaving the rainbow. If you know this a book, it's you know it's, it's not an area I'm a specialist in, but for instance, uh, brown and yellow are the same color. That's why you can't have a brown spotlight. Um, they're different colors, but uh, the, there's no difference in the uh, wavelengths of the light. But look, there's other things. Um, uh, you, know, you ask me whether that's a porcupine. Uh, and I say, yeah, it's a porcupine. I can tell porcupines by looking at them. Uh, under standard conditions, well, sort of when I get a good look at them, uh, I can tell them. But uh, something just runs from you know, between the bushes. Was that a porcupine? You know, under those conditions, I can't tell. It could have been an echidna. Uh, that those aren't the conditions under which I'm reliable as a discriminator uh, of these. Uh, I need to have a longer look at it. It needs to be sit still for a while. Maybe I need to see, see it from two sides in order to do it. All of those can be you know, parts of the standard conditions. Often it's very difficult to say what the standard conditions are for uh, you know, telling what animal that is, telling, um, uh, yeah, is this, uh, you, know, you show me, uh, you, you show the uh, archaeologist the picture of the dig and say, is this Sumerian or Assyrian? And under some circumstances, they could tell you just by looking at it. Um, but if the picture isn't showing the features that, uh, in fact, they depend on for this, they say, well, but I just can't be sure. You know, it's, uh, under these conditions, uh, I can't tell them. I can't tell them apart. Uh, so I mean, that all seems to me uh, compatible with the general picture and you know with our being in anyway often unable to say what the standard conditions are uh, we get an ability that we can rely on and uh, find out that well there's this kind of condition where I'm not reliable there's this other thing that can interfere uh, I thought I could tell uh, clouds that threatened rain from ones that didn't, but I get fooled under these other circumstances and, and say, well, it looks like rain, but I'm not, you know, claiming that it's going to rain. Yeah. Well, you'd be, I think this much is true, that uh, if you made the confident pronouncement and, uh, well, what makes you think that's a water bottle? Well, I can see it. Uh, uh, well, what made you think that these are circumstances under which the way it looks to you is to be trusted? Now, that's the sort of case which, well, you know, what reason do you have to think that that it isn't, uh, 
the, the conditions for telling that it's a water bottle, it's right in front of you, there's, there's good light. Um, uh, yes, you're endorsing that. But, you know, we're in the Museum of Conceptual Art, and you come in and you say, oh, there's a water bottle, and uh, we walk around it, and it turns out to be a wireframe thing, the Tomploy uh, sort of thing. And I was, well, it was pretty silly of you to confidently uh, you know, claim that you could see it was a water bottle. Didn't you know that the whole point of rooms like this is to fool you about that? I mean, you're pretty gullible, aren't you, that you, you didn't, didn't occur to you? These might not be standard conditions. So there could be a kind of uh, uh, epistemic criticism that you'd be subject to if you should have known that it might not be standard conditions. And there's others where, uh, no, never saw a case like this before. Always in the past, I've been able to tell. This is a new one on me. Now I realize that there, there are sources of uh, uncertainty uh, here. OK. Uh, well, let's uh, step back a little. Uh, philosophically from uh, get a little bit wider uh, scope view of this. Um, Sellers confronts a, a yeah in in section thirty five so uh, toward the end of this first half of the essay. Um, an overt or covert token of this is green in the presence of green items. Is a Konstatierung? Uh, this is, I think, Schlick's um, term of art for observation reports, what, um, I always get these confused, so don't uh, take this as gospel. Uh, Schlick and Carnap have a notion, one of them uses protocol sentences and the other uses Konstruktierung, and, and I forget who, uh, but uh, in the Vienna Circle, they talked about these basic observation reports. Uh, and expresses observational knowledge if and only if it's a manifestation of a tendency to produce overt or covert tokens of this is green given a certain set, if and only if it's being looked at in standard conditions. Now, clearly on this interpretation, the occurrence of such tokens of this is green would be following a rule only in the sense that they're instances of a uniformity. Uh, so, so he's not expressing his view here um, uh, that it's sufficient that they be uh, that the report be an exercise of a reliable uh, differential responsive disposition. He's considering that view. Uh, it would be following a rule only in the sense that there are instances of a uniformity, uh, a uniformity differing from the lightning thunder case in that an acquired causal character, that it is an acquired causal characteristic of the language used. Clearly the above suggestion, which corresponds to the thermometer view, criticized by Professor Price, Price says, why isn't it the case that um, the mercury having reached this part of the thermometer is it's expressing observational knowledge that the temperature is such and such. And he says, well, it's because mere correlation isn't enough. Uh, but let's see, however, if it cannot be revised to fit the criteria that I've been using for expressing observational knowledge. The first hurdle to be jumped concerns the authority, normative notion, epistemic notion, which, as I've emphasized, a sentence token must have in order that it can be said to express knowledge the authority that you can appeal to it to justify other claims. Clearly, on this account, 
The only thing that can remotely be supposed to constitute such authority is the fact that one can infer the presence of, green, of a green object from the fact that someone makes this report. Now, I think this is really important. He's, um, saying how I could get knowledge from the thermometer is because I can make an inference from the height of the mercury to a claim about uh, the temperature. Uh, now, that inference that I make, that's in the conceptual epistemic realm. That's a move from uh, a belief to a belief. So I have a belief about the length of the column of mercury, and I infer from that uh, a belief about the temperature. Uh, that is my taking there to be a uniformity, a correlation, a regularity relating the length of the uh, column of mercury and the temperature. Uh, that's making that inference is what it is for me to take the thermometer reliably to indicate or correlate with uh, changes in uh, temperature. Uh, and we've already noticed the correctness of a report does not have to be construed as the rightness of an action. So the idea here is uh, when I say that something is green, that's not typically an intentional action uh, on my part. That's uh, a claim that is wrung from me involuntarily uh, by the way I'm wired up and the way I'm trained. So I've been trained to uh, come to believe that there's something green in front of me uh, under circumstances like this, the visible presence of red things. That's not the kind of intentional doing. A report can be correct as being an instance of a general mode of behavior which in a given linguistic community, it's reasonable to sanction and support. OK. I mean, he's pointing to a theory that he's not laying out here, but uh, it, we don't need to know what that theory is. The second hurdle is, however, the decisive one. For we've seen that to be the expression of knowledge, a report must not only have authority, this authority must in some sense be recognized by the person who's reported it. For a constitution, this is green to express observational knowledge. Not only must it be a symptom or a sign of the presence of a green object in standard conditions, be correlated reliably with it, but the per perceiver must know that tokens of this is green are symptoms of the presence of green option, objects in conditions which are standard for visual perception. So here he's addressing a question, a specifically epistemological question, about uh, attributing perceptual knowledge to somebody or observational knowledge. And he's saying it's a necessary condition of that, that you be a reliable perceiver of that kind of thing. Uh, if you aren't, uh, A reliable perceiver, you're making this claim, it's not enough that it's true. Uh, it's got to be the output of a reliable belief-forming process, according to the one who's attributing the belief. But he says more than that's needed. You've got to have a justification for it, uh, for making the claim. Uh, and that means if the justification for my attributing knowledge is that you're reliable, You've got to know you're reliable uh, in order for it to be correct for me to say of you that you knew. Now, here Sellers is taking sides in an uh, epistemological debate that hadn't happened yet when he was writing um, uh, between uh, justificatory internalists and justificatory externalists. Is, uh, at any rate, one of the ways, uh, I think that's William Alston's uh, way of thinking about this. Um, the justificatory externalists, uh, reliabilists uh, in uh, uh, 
epistemology uh, say, no, you know, uh, what is required for knowledge uh, is uh, you have to have a belief. I mean, if you don't believe it, it's not knowing. Um, it has to be true. You can't know what isn't so. And it can't just be an accident that you made this true claim. Uh, but it's enough if, for, for me to count you as knowing, it's enough if I know uh, that your belief was not accidental, it was formed as the result of a, of a reliable belief forming process. That's the formula that uh, these justificatory externalists use. Uh, and their justification for this is, well, you know, we want uh, knowledge to be contagious. Uh, those are the beliefs that we want to spread in the community, are the ones that are knowledge. Knowledge functionally is our term for beliefs that uh, uh, about the empirical world that it would be good uh, if they were contagious, if they spread. And so we want them to be true. Uh, uh, we, we want the people we catch them from to believe them. Uh, and we want them to be non-accidentally true. We want them to be the outcome of reliable uh, belief forming processes. Uh, so mm, that's somewhere between that's what we mean by knowledge or that's a good thing to mean by knowledge for this, um, uh, for this purpose. Uh, others, uh, more traditional, say, no, uh, you don't know it if you can't give reasons justifying your belief. Uh, if you don't satisfy that first personal uh, condition, then you don't count as uh, knowing it. And Sellers is uh, going all in as a justificatory uh, internalist. Uh, he's saying you do have to be able to justify it. But if you are reliable, then you can invoke your reliability. Uh, that's uh, a form of reason you can have. You can say, uh, when they ask you, claim it's green, uh, well, what's your justification for that? Uh, I can see, I know green things when I see them. Uh, I'm a reliable reporter of green things. Yes, under these conditions. Uh, I'm also committed to these being conditions under which I'm a reliable uh, reporter. And so we can talk about that if, um, you might say, if you think these are not uh, standard conditions. Um, let me mention that um, another justificatory internalist is John McDowell, um, but he disagrees with Sellers uh, on this point. Uh, he thinks the right thing for the perceptual knower to say is just, I can see that it's green. That's his justification, uh, that his state is a state of seeing. Uh, now, it's not that he might not think that and be mistaken about it, but if he's right, if that is the state he's in, that's his justification for it. What's wrong about, from John's point of view, about there's John the McTowell, not John in the tie shop, what's uh, wrong about Seller's account is that he's taking it that my justification for uh, an observation report that I make is a version of a third person assessment of it. Third personally, it's right. When I attribute uh, knowledge to you, um, when I take it that um, uh, what you have is knowledge. Uh, my basis for that is going to be that you're a reliable reporter. You said it, and it's likely to, and it's likely to be true because you're a reliable reporter of it. I make the um, reliability inference from your saying it to 
you're endorsing it to its being endorsement worthy by me. That's what it is to take you to be uh, reliable. In the third person case, that's what I do. But John thinks it's crucial that in the first person case, that's not what I do. Uh, in the first person case, I invoke my state of seeing. Um, various things turn uh, on this difference. I'm not going to uh, pursue that issue here. Uh, I think one can split the difference um, between justificatory internalists and justificatory externalists by focusing on attributions of knowledge. Uh, say, the important question to ask uh, is not what is knowledge? Uh, give me necessary and sufficient conditions for S knows that P. Uh, rather, think about what someone's doing when they attribute knowledge. Uh, and on the JTB account, the traditional account, Out of uh, coming out of Plato, um, it's true opinion with an account. Uh, what I'm doing is three things: I'm attributing a commitment. That's the belief condition. Uh, a commitment, an endorsement, a claim. Uh, I'm endorsing it myself. That's the truth condition. I have to take it true, so I have to uh, endorse it. Uh, and uh, I have to have a reason uh, for endorsing it. Uh, it has to be a justified belief, uh, but that can be justified for me. Uh, the reliabilists are right about that. Uh, if you, that this is a sort of reliabilist case, uh, you don't realize that you and your twin brother are uh, Corsican brothers and in telepathic communication when one of them struck, the other one also feels the pain. Uh, but I've been observing you very closely in the time you've been separated, uh, and I've discovered that you are. Um, uh, if you report uh, claims, well, uh, I've sort of screwed this uh, example up. Uh, if I know you're reliable and you don't uh, know that you're reliable, I can still attribute knowledge to you. The reliabilists are right about that. But they're wrong to think that that means justification has nothing to do with knowledge. Uh, it's the attributor of knowledge who has to be able to give a reason, and they can cite reliability as the reason. Why does this difference uh, make a difference? Well, thinking about the attributions of knowledge focuses on what I'm doing in taking what you said was true, namely endorsing it myself, uh, instead of chasing a property of truth. Um, and I take that to be uh, an advantage. But uh, reliabilists in epistemology have consistently drawn the conclusion that uh, inference justification doesn't matter except as a special case of reliable belief forming mechanisms. That is that having reasons is an instance of a reliable belief forming mechanism, but there's others. And so we might extrude justification having reasons from the picture entirely. And I want to say no on inferentialist semantic grounds, that to be conceptually contentful is to occupy a position in a space of implications, of justifications, so that the belief condition that you have uh, a doxastic commitment a propositionally contentful commitment is all ready to talk about the justificatory relations that it stands in to other things. And for those, 
you can't just substitute reliable belief forming mechanisms, reliable what forming conditions. It's not a belief unless it stands in these justificatory relations and both serve as and stand in need of uh, reasons. Sellers doesn't go uh, very far with this uh, line of thought because his particular concern is, uh, gee, isn't this justificatory internalism raising the bar too high? Uh, the particular uh, claim that he doesn't make until later, until 40, section 45, is how uh, we now recognize that instead of coming to have a concept of something because we've noticed that sort of thing, to have the ability to notice some, that sort of thing is already to have the concept of that sort of thing and can't account for it. So the empiricist picture of concept acquisition, remember acquisition from the inconsistent triad right at the beginning, is, uh, well, you noticed um, a red thing, you noticed another red thing, you noticed another one, you noticed what was common to them, uh, and you acquired the concept red that way. But he's saying, no, I mean, noticing something red, being aware of something red, requires applying the concept red to it. You have to already have the concept in order to respond to it by uh, seeing it as red. Uh, but if you don't get the concept red or square or any other concept by noticing things that have it elsewhere, um, Sellers makes fun of this picture of the infant mind. Uh, ah, there's one. There's another one. Yes, that's it again. By the powerful inductive methods of John Stuart Mill, that must be what mama means by red. That's the, the picture he's rejecting. No, you have to already have the concept red and be applying it to be aware of it in the sense that he cares about sapience apperception, uh, the sense that involves knowing anything. Uh, but if you already have to have the concept in order to notice red things or triangular things, how can you get it? Uh, now, this idea that uh, concept use is an epistemic notion, uh, involves justification, involves the application of concepts, that awareness presupposes those concepts. Uh, where do you get them from? This was a rationalist idea. Uh, that's what Leibniz, in particular, thought, by contrast to Locke uh, in his debate with him, uh, he concluded, well, they must be innate. Uh, you must already have to have them uh, in order to experience anything. And the trouble was, this was almost literally unbelievable, because uh, this wasn't just structural concepts. It was concepts like dog. Uh, Jerry Fodor, near to our own time, sort of has a view like this. That, you know, there has to be an innate set of basic concepts for uh, even empiricism uh, to work. Kant, uh, who certainly thinks that you have to have the concept in order to apperceive anything, to be conceptually aware of it, uh, struggles with this question of where concepts uh, come from. Uh, he has in the third critique an account of judgments of reflection that uh, get us new concepts from old concepts. How does the whole thing get off the ground? Well, basically, he kicks that from our empirical activity to our transcendental uh, activity. Uh, we, that's part of the capacities we have to bring cognitive enterprise. But Sellers uh, can't say anything like that. Uh, his view is uh, 
foreshadowed in the account of how the importance of the social dimension and the historical dimension in rule governance uh, that uh, I can become a reliable reporter of things, a reliable responder to things before I have the concept. Uh, and then once I get the concept, uh, I can remember that uh, I was responding uh, reliably. And so know not just of myself now, but of myself then that I was uh, reliable. Now, I don't think he tells this story very well uh, here, and it's a crucial point. Uh, if the alternative to thinking that uh, states that can stand in justificatory relations can be things you can just have without having to acquire concepts, if that's the myth of the given, uh, as it is, then the question of what it is to get these concepts is absolutely crucial. So I'll finish up soon, but let me say in general how I think this goes. Uh, I mentioned when I introduced the Kantian normative turn, the normative revolution, that it involved a shift of uh, perspective from thinking about our grip on concepts to thinking about their grip on us. When uh, Kant comes to think of concepts as rules, the question is, uh, what makes you subject to assessment according to that rule? What makes you fall under that uh, rule? And Sellers has a social view about that. Uh, I'd epitomize it with a parable. Uh, suppose your 18-month-old uh, toddles into the uh, living room and is the first coherent sentence uh, they've ever uttered, says, Daddy, the house is on fire. Oh, well, you're going to be glad that they could put the words together, but you're not going to take them to have claimed or to believe that the house is on fire. Uh, you're not going to ask them for their evidence. You're not going to hold them responsible uh, for the consequences of this claim. Uh, it's cute. They're putting the words together. If your four-year-old comes in and says, uh, Daddy, the house is on fire, you are going to hold her responsible. So, why did you smell smoke? You know, where is the fire? Uh, you know, what should we be doing? Uh, you're going to take them to have made this claim, maybe irresponsibly, but you hold them responsible. Now, what has changed in the meantime? Well, they've gotten more reliable at the language entry transitions. So they pretty reliably, when they say red, there's something red there. They're willing to infer there's something red if they say that. Uh, they've gotten more reliable at the language exit transitions. They say, <clears throat> I'm going to do something. They typically go and do it. But crucially, they've gotten more reliable at the language language moves, at being able to tell what else they'd be committing themselves to by uh, making the claim. Uh, that's a precondition of your holding them responsible. They get better and better at that. And at a certain point, you start holding them responsible. There isn't some bright line in how good they get uh, at making the moves such that before that, they're really not grasping the concept. And after that, they really are. Fundamentally, this change is not one that happens between their ears. Fundamentally, this change happens in their social status. They're good enough at making the moves and the transitions that there's a point to holding them responsible. So it's analogous to the difference between someone who uh, the day before their 21st birthday signs this document uh, and making the very same moves with the pen the day after their 21st birthday. The day afterwards, they've just committed themselves to pay the bank thousands of dollars every month for the rest of their lives, or at least 
for 30 years. Uh, the day before, they didn't. Uh, you can't enter into a contract like that before your legal majority. Uh, why not? Well, the thought was young ones aren't good enough yet at knowing the consequences of undertaking a commitment. We shouldn't let them do it. We shouldn't hold them responsible uh, for this. Did anybody ever think that every 22-year-old was more responsible in this way than every 20-year-old? No, but you know, the law made uh, uh, a mark here. But the point is there isn't any change in the person from the day before they achieve their legal majority to the day after. It's entirely a change in their social status, and they're being held responsible. And Seller's view is that uh, using concepts is not a matter of your grip on them. How good are you at making the moves? Well, yes, that's important, but that isn't what makes the difference. It's their grip on you. And normative statuses are social statuses. Uh, it's a question of whether your status in the community is one where we hold you responsible, whether we acknowledge the authority of your claim and will make inferences from it, not as though you were a thermometer from your making it, but from the content of the claim. Uh, will we take that to be a reason for uh, us to uh, endorse it? And yeah, there's no point in doing that with people who just aren't good enough at making the right moves discriminating what follows and what doesn't. But uh, there's also no bright line of how good you have to be such that uh, uh, if you're not that good, it would be wrong to hold you uh, responsible. Or there's some fact about what's going on inside you uh, that we would be failing to recognize. No, he's been applying concepts for years. Wittgenstein talks about this. Uh, in many places, but one of them is when he worries about, I suppose we were talking about reading, learning to read just in the sense of being able to make the noise that uh, goes, you know, pronounce the words that are on the page, never mind uh, understand them. Uh, uh, what sense could we make of the first word that you read? Uh, before that, you were responding, and sometimes you got it right. You know, what do we say about the first word that you read? Uh, I don't know. I think about that case because, as you, as you may know, uh, being able to read silently was a relatively late uh, historical development. Uh, Julius Caesar was famous because he taught himself to do this uh, so that soldiers passing by his tent couldn't hear what he was what he was reading, but it was remarkable. He was the only person of his time who could do this. Reading then was the combination of these two capacities. You could make the noises and you could understand the noises. You could get the sense from them. Uh, Augustine uh, rode on a mule for three days to see a monk who was reputed to be able to gather the sense of a text uh, without moving his lips. And Augustine was sure he just memorized all the books that he had there. So he brought a new book that he knew was rare enough. The guy would never, and it turned out he could, uh, he could do this. And it's an example. So we actually just turned out to be pretty easy to teach people to do this. And now you know, it's not uh, a, strange, uh, a strange thing. But I digress. OK. Uh, next time. Uh, We'll read the second half of EPM. There's a bunch of the secondary literature that I recommend, the McDowell uh, article. If you didn't look at the first of uh, Sellers' Karras lectures this time, that'd be a good thing uh, to look at. Uh, but it's about theory and observation and the inner. Uh, and some of those issues will reverberate uh, going forward. <laughs>